Great. So I think I'll just start off by asking you, what's your general opinion on VAR? I mean, do you think it works in the Premier League or not? Well, I think you have to come from the basis of when I was boss of the PGMOL some years ago and uh, went to watch rugby and introduced from that immediately uh, the communication kits that we see now around the world. That, that was new to uh, soccer referees, football referees. And then a few years later, I uh, was concerned. I went to a game at, at Old Trafford where Roy Carroll dropped the ball over the line. Yes, and yeah. That, that started me going to the Premier League at the summer conference and putting forward a proposal that I wanted goal line technology. And I worked very closely with Paul, Dr. Paul Hawkins of Orkai to bring that about. We did a lot of testing at uh, Motspur Park, Fulham. Um, we did, uh, if you like, uh, testing for the IFAB. And we, we, we also basically, uh, along with a guy called Mike Foster, who was then the secretary and director of the Premier League, we, we wrote a protocol for the IFAB on goal line technology. And the reason I mention that is that I, I start off on the basis that uh, modern refereeing covered by a minimum in the Premier League of 22 cameras will always expose error. And for me, uh, it shouldn't be that the man who's the commentator up in the box has more information than the man on the field of play. As a consequence of that, uh, he knows through what he's seeing, there's an error being made. And the referee, who's very knowledgeable, quite fit, very experienced, if you reach the PGMOL level, um, is exposed. So I'm coming from a point that we need a degree of uh, help and assistance and equilibrium to give us those viewing angles that are appropriate to a referee who is caught out of position. And we have to understand that the process of refereeing is first of all to see, then to recognize, think, and act. So that's the process. So now, so I'm coming on a foundation that I want VAR. And I've sat in conferences way ahead of VAR being introduced, both in this country, in Portugal, in China, and other parts of the world promoting the idea of VAR, wasn't called that then, but let's, let's not argue that point, to say, look, it will be here and it will be here forevermore. Now we get into what I think is a very narrow view by the PGMOL. First of all, it's evident to me that the Premier League, who are one third of the board of the PGMOL, along with the Football League and the FA, didn't want VAR. Now, whether that's because of the fear of the people that pay them the greatest amount of money, i.e. television, and the, the risk that they think is going to interfere. But you know, we saw it work quite effectively at the World Cup when it was introduced. Mm -hmm. And we saw to some degree there, the use of good communication, we couldn't listen in, but we could actually see the process that the referee was maintaining ownership by going to the monitor. So VAR got off to a rocky start because it didn't apply the principles and protocols, if you like, of what the IFAB laid down. The foundation of that is and they're still struggling with what is clear and obvious, massive, massive area. And they're still, you know, they were reluctant for at least a season to use the pick side monitor, the referee review area. And one wonders whether in fact, they're still using that sensibly and correctly. And this is almost like, uh, the psychological impact of a referee when he's got to go to the monitor. So that has to be dealt with. That has to be, you know, if you're out in the middle, and I've done 20 or 50 odd years of active refereeing, 
When you're out in the middle, if somebody tells you you're wrong, you dismiss it. That's the first thing you've done all your life. And you believe that everything you do with the greatest integrity and respect, that you're right. And that's, it's not an arrogance. It's about your, you as a person, because you believe that you've trained, you've done many games. So the old point here is the shock of a referee um, seeing something and making a decision and then being told he's got it wrong and then he needs to review it. And it's almost in the English Premier League become a walk of shame. And we know that when they get to the monitor, they are in effect uh, almost conditioned to believing that what is being said by VAR is what they've got to accede to. And I think that what we don't see is transparency because is Neil Swarbrick, nice guy, is uh, Mike Riley or is Adam Watts, three people who are managers, you know, the ultimate boss is Riley, uh, Adam Watts is the manager of the PGML referees. And are they at Stocky Park almost saying, God is saying, I've got it wrong. And what we saw this weekend is Mike Dean in a very good position to view. The ball wasn't in play because he'd awarded correctly a free kick. So he's now move, moving as a referee into the dropping zone. And then we see uh, the reaction of a player and the reaction of two players. And Mike, Mike Dean, I've known him for many years, is a referee that if he sees a red card, believe me, he produces it instantly. He did not. So I have an insight into saying he wasn't going to card that at all. He was going to manage it effectively. But now, a guy who's had half as many games this year and he's less than competent, I, I mean... He, his career is towards the end of his career. I know that Dean is 52, but I'm showing the example of the impact of VAR if it's not used correctly. Because what it does is it gives this guy who the referee is exposed to the public and the media and everything else, VAR is sat in the room, comfortable, and it's very easy to make big decisions. And I find it amazing because Lee Mason is a referee who this season has done a lot less games than Mike Dean. I think he's done nine today. And he's not issued a red card. And he's very, very low with his yellow cards. So I'm actually saying that it's not the, it's not the equipment that's the problem here. It's, it's first of all, do we need to strengthen and talk about protocols? But the protocols are working generally in other countries much better. There's no question. And if we look at clear and obvious, we know full well that on the MLS, only one in three games has a VAR involvement. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I think we've got this basis of um, a power play within the PGMOL as to who is in control and the referees uh, getting lazy. Right, yeah. There's a great anecdotal story that's given by Nigel Owens, the rugby, league, rugby union referee of great repute, probably the best official that's existed in any sport in the world. Great communicator, great man manager. And he tells a story of, he uses anecdotal evidence that says, okay, in those uh, early years, um, VAR or the equivalent was like having, you know, if you could liken it to a tightrope and, and someone on a tightrope, uh, without the tightrope, you're alert, you're absolutely focused, and you're on the you you you're in a game mode. Make no mistake. 
But what VAR does is it gives you this um, uh, safety net and you become comfortable and less efficient and more reliant on VAR. And so we've moved from an area of uh, referee being in total control and making mistakes to now spending a lot of money, but that's not a problem to the Premier League. Um, and in some instances, creating mistakes and creating errors. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, I mean, I, to a degree, football's always been full of mistakes, but before you haven't had, you know, another referee, you know, with VAR, there's another referee to add to the, to the complexion. You know, you've got that word in your ear saying, you know, I think you should have a look at that. Do you think that was a wrong decision you made? Do you think it's sort of adding more pressure onto the on-field referee than it used to? Well, I think that um, the, the problem is that you're, they've, they've got to come to terms with the, the fact that they remain the decision maker. That, that, and they're not. And, and I think that what they're doing is succumbing to the guy sat in Stockley Park and saying, well, if he says it's a red, it's a red. If he says it's whatever it is, it's, it's whatever it is. And part of that is, you know, let, it, let us make no mistake. That's that side of it. But we've also now got to look at, and I want to dwell on, offsides. And the reason I want to dwell on that is simple. Um, we are taking the law to its point of uh, accuracy, that they're trying to measure accurately, almost like we are on goal line technology. Right. So the basis of this is to get the accuracy that we required on goal line technology, we had to finish up with seven cameras around each goal operating at speeds of 500 frames per second into the software program to get a reaction that was not immediate, but almost immediate, okay? Understand no human involvement. The human element of that is in the setup to ensure that the cameras and everything else prior to a game and the monitor and everything else is calibrated. Yeah. Now, when we go to, and that, that, that in one game, they failed to do that, Aston Villa versus Sheffield United. Now we go to offside and the complication of offside, where you're not looking at a single line. And uh, if you like, a single face, vertical face. Because let me tell you that one of the problems we experienced with goal line technology was the goalposts weren't vertical and parallel. Mm. So you operate a, a vertical face on the back line of the goal line in order to determine whether the ball's crossed the line or not. 500 frames per second and all that goes with it. With, with uh, offside, we have two lines to consider, if not more. There are, there are more, it's more complex. One, the point at which the ball is kicked, and at that point is kicked, players can be in an offside position, but they've not committed an offence. They only commit an offence when they're active. So into that decision-making process, there is a time lag. There's a the, the, the vision of, of at that instantly you see it, is he offside? Yes, he's in an offside position. Now you've got to determine, is he interfering with an opponent? Is he gaining an advantage? And, and the like. Um, and there's distance that's a variable. From the point at which it's kicked to the point at which it's played or attempted to play. And you're operating with cameras at 500 frames per second. So if I take, uh, you, you're operating, sorry, at, at offside at 50 frames per second. Right. 
So if you take a loaf of bread and you put 500 slices in it, the, the law of average says that in that middle area where you want a decision, you're going to be accurate. If you now take a loaf of bread and say it's 50 slices and you go in the middle, you've got, you could have 25 either side because you ain't got a middle one. And which side of it do you pick? And that's my analogy. And as a result, you've, you've got, you've, first of all, you've brought an, a human element in, which you have to have at this moment because of the law. And you have uh, a man who has to pick the frame and then play around with a slide rule. Yeah, so to, to a degree, there's always going to be a human yeah. element I mean, and the ability to create error. Well, I, I think that when it comes to offside, I think the only, the only rule in is that you have the technology and you actually build the law around the technology. Yeah. You know, that, that's what you have to do. And so, so we, we can argue. So... Unlike in Europe, Europe, believe it or not, and part of the, almost the rest of the world, don't have the sort of debates and discussions on offside that we have. Offside has always been a contentious issue. It, it's, it's in our DNA yeah. as fans, as players, as footballers. And therefore, it's got to go a long way to answer that criticism because we all think that the guys made a mistake um, when, in fact, England has a reputation of producing, the, despite what media say, of producing the very best world, uh, system referees. And if we look at that, we can prove that with Cannon, Malarkey, Sharp and Warren being four referees that actually ran the line in World Cup finals. Two of them for other referees, not English referees. Yeah. So uh, on that selection basis, officials so i think there's a there's a basic problem in the english game with regard to offside and what is acceptable and the current law is an ass in relation to that um, and the two at this moment in time are not going to be a product that anybody's going to buy into but, you know, because we can argue, but I can argue on the technology being uh, short of what it, where it needs to be. There's all sorts of other geometry that comes into play. But then what they've not done at this moment in time is they've not used GPS, uh, which is available to them, which is used as part of the performance analysis of players. And I used to use ProZone as a means of analyzing referees because I, I had that facility of a, a software package um, post-match where I could draw a line, but I didn't draw it. The actual people who produced ProZone drew it. But it gave me a lot of analysts, uh, I, you know, because when, when you're reviewing performance, and I don't think it's been done enough. And I think coaching is weak at the moment by the people who are doing the coaching. Um, you, the training element is the weakness within the English game. That's, that's that part. Now we come to the fans and, um, and the stakeholders in the game. And, um, you know, is it strawberry jam or is it gooseberry jam? And uh, it, at the moment, it's gooseberry. And everybody thinks it's tart and it's unacceptable. It's not palatable. Yeah. And that's because the marketing of it is poor. Uh, and that's a lack of communication. And, and, and it's a lack of engagement with the fans. So if we go to the MLS, the MLS started by producing a film before every game that went on the screen that said... VAR is operating today. This is what it is. This is what it does. And we'll keep you informed. Mm. I think to um, a degree, most fans, especially when we could be in stadiums, were saying, um, 
we have no idea what's going on with a certain decision. All you see is the referee with the hand on the ear. You know, there's a degree of um, people saying it's killing the passion for the game. Oh, I mean, the, the thing is this. If you're, in a, if you're in an empty room or a stadium um, and it's silent, time takes an age. Every second is almost like a minute psychologically. If you're in a stadium and there's music playing or in a room where there's music playing, your attention is, you're not worried about time. What, what we've got here is just an attempt and a weak attempt for an organization that is world-class in many other areas at communicating to its fan. It, it, it says to me that there's a lack of understanding and expertise in relation to social media and how they can transmit that information. And what I smile, I, you know, I sat at a conference a few weeks ago in Portugal. I, I was on Zoom. Uh, I've chaired that meeting in the past, all purely on VAR. And I and and I've sent you the note. Bundesliga. Uh, Portugal, which is not the same level of quality as <clears throat> the Premier League, and the MLS use Twitter to inform. So, because the argument is that, you know, the initial argument is, why can't we do it like rugby? And I see absolutely no reason why we can't do it by rugby. And everybody then says, oh, we'll get at the, the referee and all that. Well, They don't get at the referee because the referee at rugby union shows authority. And if the game needs support, it's a little bit like the law. The law states that if a, a player or a manager or a coach follows the referee into the referee review area, it's a cautionable offence, yellow card. We've never seen one, have we? No. So... If we're out on the field and we've got a big screen and we're looking at that big screen, it's very easy to say you're not allowed to come within the referee four metres. If you do, you get a yellow card. So yeah. I, I think the old scenario is, um, and then it says, well, referees can't communicate. Well, I'm a former referee. I think I can communicate. Uh, I think uh, Howard Webb can communicate. I think Clattenburg, Walton, uh, don't agree with it, with Walton's views on BT at times, but the ultimate aim is that they're, they're capable of communicating. I know the referees, and every one of those referees is capable of communicating. And if you don't, and if they're not, then you educate them. You bring in an expert. And what you do is it's very simple. You have a protocol. You know, when, it, when I first introduced, the, and the reason why I mentioned the communication kits is the chatter that can break the concentration of a referee. So you actually formulize, not me as the boss, but those active referees, what is the, what is, if you like, the, the criteria and protocol for the use of the communication kits? And, and you, you operate it, you, 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 know, you tweak it as accordingly. You know, we, we started off with some assistant referees having a push button to talk. And we found that they were doing that under pressure in the game. And so we took that away and said, right, it's open mic. Then we had everybody talking. Everybody wanted to tell the referee about decisions. And so the whole aspect here is how well do you review every decision that you make how well do the referees as a group with the boss of the VAR and how regularly do they meet and discuss the VAR process and the decisions? Uh, so that shared mistakes or shared great things are quick learning tools to getting a degree of uniformity and uh, enhancing the, the, if you like, reducing the risk of the potholes that they're going through at the moment.
Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, totally from that point of view. You know, I, I think it's sad. I think it's uh, really sad that they've got themselves in a position where, you know, I, I work with uh, referees in other countries and and they, they we've gone past the smile bit, you know, and, we, and, and what it's doing is, you know, if we take this week's weekend's action, I'll just give you, I'm trying to give you a broad brush as, as a former boss, because um, when a referee, when I was boss and a referee made a major error, K, KMI as we call it, key major incident, um, that referee would not referee the following week. Um, the simplicity of that is, is that punishment? Well, the stakeholders said, he's doing it again, he's punishing everybody, it's harsh. It wasn't to do with that. It's about one reflection by that referee to analyze and understand his error. And if you make two errors, it can have a real negative effect, depending on who the person is, in terms of confidence. But more than that, it does what it says on the tin in the last week. It almost ruins a referee's reputation. And yeah, so, I, I, yeah, I was going to say, to a degree, do you think there should be um, more accountability? So for Mike Dean, um, his red card was obviously reversed. But then to a degree, was it his fault or was it the VAR um, Lee Mason? Well, I think ultimately, at the end of the day, the, the, the thing that you have to ask is, um, I can drive a car, but I can't drive a bus. It's a different challenge, isn't it? And therefore, I can referee, but can I referee with VAR? And if I'm a good referee, does that make me a good VAR operator? Yeah. And if I've then got, and this is what you'll find in one of the slides, I think, because I asked the question before the presentation and the guy produced the slide. So what we've got is, We've got the usual relationship in in the tier process. So let us let us say here, we've got uh, Martin Atkinson, the most experienced referee, and currently performing really well. Pretty laid back, nice guy. Eighteen games today season, and you've got. Uh, Simon Hooper, two or three games. He's watched Martin Atkinson on the uh, on the big screen for a number of years. He might even aspire to be Martin Atkinson, mm. right? And he's going to tell Martin Atkinson that he's made a mistake and he needs to look at it, right? That relationship is fraught with problems. And reverse, you've got a very experienced referee who says, I'm VAR today. And, and what happens is the VAR operator uh, becomes its television rather than a duty in relation to a job and task in hand. And all of a sudden, something happens and he goes, need to look at that. And Simon Hooper now is being told by Martin Atkinson he's made a mistake. He's made a mistake, hasn't he? Simon Hooper, Martin Atkinson, he's telling me I've got it wrong. So what they're not working on here, and, and I see it from a distance because I know the individual, so I've got a quite a detailed look, is the relationship between VAR and referee. And just like you have good referees, you have good VAR operators, and you have inferior VAR operators. And, and therefore, uh, and you have good managers. And, and, and former referees might be good managers on the part, but that doesn't mean that in a business environment, you know, 
the, the, the head of VAR needs to effectively be a man with a degree of power that, that, that can actually say, leave me alone. And the boss of the PGML says, I've got total trust in, me, in you. you, you deal with it. And tell me how you got into this mess. Um, and what are you doing about Mike Dean? And of course, then what happens is the the smoke screen that puts up. I mean, I got accused of coming out too often and saying this referee's made a mistake, so it's not refereeing next to him. Right. And maybe I did too much of that. But on reflection, I finished up with a cadre of world class referees. Ten minimum ten referees that were absolutely top draw. And some of those referees, Atkinson, Mariner, Dean, are continuing to fly the flag and have not been replaced. Yeah. Don't, blame, <clears throat> don't blame me for succession planning. You know, I mean, um, we, are, I mean I, I, we have a car, don't we? We have a car, we buy a car and we say, right, okay, we replace it every two years if we can afford it. We know that when it's five years, six years old, um, it's got, it's not as, you know, there's still a, there's a doubt about it. It might let us down. And <clears throat> within that, I had things like Prozone and Polar Heart monitors that gave me um, how the recovery rates, how the physicality of that individual was performing. I used sports psychologists to reduce I don't know how well they're using sports psychology now. I don't know how well they're using, because I use the vision scientist as well. Um, and when they go to the screen, are there too many distractions? <clears throat> you know, I mean, they... uh, yeah, I think there's an argument to be made about, um, as well, about obviously with COVID not, not being any fans in the stadium, whereas before there were you know, thousands of fans screaming at the referee to make a certain decision. Do you think there's a, you know, is, it, is there a big difference between those two scenarios, do you think? I don't think in terms of VAR. I think it actually we should get improved VAR operation in, right. that, in that scenario because there's not the, 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 the physical pressure on the, on the players. And we, we are seeing slightly different games, aren't we? Um, so I think that um, in this period of time, the actual uh, answer to your question long term is I'm very much for VAR. I think that offside and the law and now VAR plays with offside, if they want to make it independent, they've got to make it independent. I'm, I'm quite clear that in this country, um, it, it's not working as well as it could because, um, you know, if you buy a, a, a car, a brand new car, you're expected to have four wheels on. And what they've done is the car arrived with four wheels and it's got three now. In the, in the, in the eye of the stakeholder, the spectator, they don't want it. The media don't want it at all. If you listen to it, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to quote Richard Keyes. Richard Keyes from day one said this is a bad thing. And, and what, what some of their observations are accurate because let's say it's a goal, it's a no-goal scenario. That should be a soft, it's okay. You know, just play it. Play the video in, in the in the stop part, play it with a seven second delay that gives an instant look that says that looks okay. But what we're doing is we're creating a uh, oh let's wait and see, a super check, a super duper, every button's on the shirt, you know, you're looking smart and it's great, yeah. It, it it's um and the underlying management problem that's taken away pleasure. And um, it's almost like uh, 
let's say we're going to make bread. And the first time we do it, we absolutely stick to the ingredients. And the further we get away, we still stick to the ingredients, but we might change them and tweak them a little bit. And that's where the human element comes into play. You know, Mike, that really does look like a red card. Well, I'm not giving one. You know, and, and don't try, you know, at the end of the day, why did VAR get involved? Why? Because, uh, oh, I want to be, I want to, it's almost like it's a hot potato and VAR doesn't want to carry the can and neither does the referee and we get a fudge decision on what is, look, you can use this in your, you can use this in your dissertation. Why did we get such an easy decision in law wrong? So nobody's asking that question. What we're doing is we're personalizing it with this referee and this VAR operator. Whereas what we should be saying is, what is wrong psychologically that these two experienced referees, right? Either is it, is it miscommunication or is it a fear factor that everything has got to be absolutely lily white? I think it's far better to say, I'm not giving a red card and be proven wrong later than it is to give somebody a red card and prove them wrong later. And, and I, I, it's beyond me. It, it's, it, you know, I mean, I, I should have, the way we're at in, in English refereeing, and it's not VAR that's the problem. It's not the system. I've, I've suggested to you areas, you know, I think the system on offside is flawed. So I would say I, I, I wouldn't accept VAR procedure currently on offside. I would do what the MLS do and that is defer that decision to a second view with an assistant referee. And that's what we should be doing, not trying to get into the realms of. Now, we're in, we're in a battle here with the media who can draw the lines. And, and therefore, there's, there's potentially fear factor. And what we should be saying is, well, if you want to draw the lines, you draw the lines. But this is the system that we're not operating at the moment because we don't trust it. But then you'd be going to the boss of the Premier League who negotiates the television deal and says the integrity of your, your competition is being brought into disrepute because of the offside situation, where if, you, if it's going to be a toe offside, it's toe offside. The, that's the law. It was never intended to be that. Yeah. We've, we've created that. So I think the MLS and Howard Webb and, and Greg Barkey, who's the manager, are right in saying until the technology on offside is good enough, we're going to defer to a visual, a second replay, if you like, with the same information and a call made by an expert assistant referee. That's what we should be doing. And we should actually be reducing the number of people who are VAR operators, not increasing it. We yeah. should be, you know, I mean, again, what's happening at the moment is you've got a guy who's refereeing on a Saturday, could be VAR the following day, and he could have two games when he's, and, and let's say he makes an error in this game, the first one, as a referee, and that's still playing on his mind. And he's got, he's got, you know, he's got two more games, he's got two games to do today. Or even in the first one, he makes an error, he's got another one. So it, it's the, it, it's, for me, it's the improvement of the human element 
apart from offsides with the VAR and everything else is VAR. Now we move on because that's where we're at today. Where it needs to be, I'm quite clear, is if you look at, uh, I've sent you a note to look at, I don't know if you've seen Gerard Gillett yet, but you could use it, that film clip, because it's on YouTube. It's in the final of the A-League competition. Jared Gillett is currently, he's an Aussie, he was the top Australian referee. He's currently a referee in here yeah. on the championship. Um, and he's absolutely right, because at that point, we weren't using monitors, they were in Australia, plus open mic. So a goal or something's been scored, and it's going to a check or something. And uh, Jared says, well, I'll go to the monitor just to sell the decision. And that's what he does. And they sell a perfect decision. So use that as a, as a form. But ultimately, the, the scope must be that we have to get to where rugby union is. But we also have to recognise, I think it's about a 19-year uh, timeline in that. But they got there a lot before. But I think it's been operating in rugby about that, that level of time. That's how far football is behind rugby. So uh, that's the interesting bit. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I think finally, just you said you wouldn't, you said you'd um, carry on with VAR. You don't think it's worth like just getting rid now or Absolutely do you think not. it should be given more time? No, 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 no. no. No, because you go back to the basis of why it was introduced. Are you going to get rid of goal line technology? Are you going to get rid of communication kits? So the world moves on. And what is important is, uh, you know, um, you want to improve the accuracy of decision making. And if you're reliant on one guy who could have someone run in front of him, obstruct his view or even not be in the right position which is you know skill sets improve with players that's the biggest challenge can I get in the right position that's why you move from you know in my era probably doing nine ten well probably nine thousand nine and a half thousand meters to the to someone in the championship doing twelve thousand meters in the premier league doing eleven and a half thousand meters in distance that's why you I brought a sprint coach in to move from, uh, you know, endurance running to explosive sprinting in order to recover the shortfall or the skill set of the player. The player who makes a quick move, you're out of position. And the only way you can respond is to get back in tune by an explosive sprint. So you adjust. So VAR is here to stay. Um, and I think the sooner they, they put in the level of education and management and coaching and transparency into the process, the better. Um, and, uh, and think seriously, you know, as I have done, how do other countries operate? And what are they doing, the others? Why, why, is, why is the Bundesliga... The MLS and Portuguese League, and I've no doubt others, why do they operate Twitter? We don't. It, it, you know, is that a lack of knowledge of how social media operates? That it's a, it's a key driver to communicating with a fan base. And if that is the case, then okay. And Old Trafford and, Manche and uh, Liverpool don't have big screens to operate like rugby then overcome that because most people now carry a mobile phone and and it's dead easy to put the replay on the mobile phone and say this is why the decision's made why aren't we doing that you know so is it I, I think it's almost like we don't you know it's a, a lack of energy um, to, to make the system better because other countries are going to operate it. You know, I've sat with a company this week, probably you should look at, who, uh, who produced a, uh, a system whereby it's almost like a, the test pilot has 
a flight simulator for VAR. And it's a, it's a cracking system where, you know, you can put someone in a room or on the laptop and you can train. And that's, that's what needs to be done. So those facilities are there. They've got to just open up a bit more uh, rather than actually sitting in a room, actually, and believe that what they're doing is right, actually always examine what they're doing and is it right and what are other countries doing and why, why is, look, you're always going to have problems with VAR because the laws are opinion in some areas. I dispute with Mark Clattenberg and Mark Elsey on occasions uh, in the media um, because of the law and how, how I interpret it against others. Um, so, but nobody comes out, do they? I mean, like, you come out with stupid statements and you think, what is that about? You know, why, why, why don't you just, why do you try and defend the indefensible because it made such a crass error? But it, it's examining why one of the most experienced referees, and yeah, he's, he's a, look, he's got a personality a lot of people don't like. He's like Marmite. I can tell he's totally different off the park. He's a really nice kid to work with. He has got a number. He is slightly arrogant. He, it's a defence mechanism. Because he didn't go to a public school. Right? That's one. I can bring that argument in. He didn't go to university. But he loves the game and he loves refereeing. And the reason he did that was, you know, at some point in his career, when I took him on to become a PGMR ref, he, at that point, he was a chicken plucker. He got a low-level job, low-paid job, because you wanted time to be able to referee. So, and he's given huge commitment. And I, and I feel sad that a top referee, you know, I, I, even I had a go, because I said in the Telegraph, they need to retire. But the point I was trying to make is that this is a young man's game. They've got to be athletic. And they've got to be coached and trained far much better than they are at the moment. Because some of them are just not good enough. You know, Mason, I said three years ago he should retire. And why is it that, you know, why is it he's only had nine games this season and Martin Atkinson, who's about the same age, has had 18? Tells you something, doesn't it? I don't have anything to do with the appointments. That's my, my Riley's position. So he's already put uh, Lee Mason in a box. At what point in the line do you draw the line and go, you're off, and new fresh blood comes in? It's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. I think that just about wraps it up. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks, Lewis. All the best.